Hello YouTube, Sidekick here with the third episode in this series that I am going to start calling, I think, mini documentaries about the history of iron bombing. When the series started, it was really inspired by my desire to find out more about the history of how air power has been used, mostly in support of troops on the ground, and how those shifts can be seen in the way the aircraft and the weapons they use developed and evolved. And I particularly wanted to be able to use the fact that we now have a wide variety of these aircraft and weapons available in flight simulators, particularly a digital combat simulator or DCS. So now we can do more than talk about the aircraft uh, to some extent. We can actually sit in them and fly them and maybe even recreate the missions that they flew. But as the series has progressed, though, uh, the flight simulation angle has become less important, uh, mostly because the history itself is actually fascinating, but also because uh, the period that we're talking about right now, between, say, 1945 and 1955, um, there just aren't a lot of aircraft from that period available in the simulators. And so, again, this episode, we won't be spending a lot of time, well, we won't be spending any time in virtual cockpits, but fear not. Uh, by the time we are done today, we will have worked our way up to the point where one iconic aircraft that flew and fought in this time period is available in the sim. And so the next episode, we will, I promise, take a look at that aircraft. And of course, I speak of the F-86 Sabre, and we'll do it in some detail. For now, though, let's remember where we were at the end of the last episode. And uh, by the way, if you haven't watched the previous videos, I would seriously recommend doing that. Um, we'll be here when you get back. At the end of the last episode, anyways, we were on the eve of the outbreak of the Korean War, and I won't bother going into the details and causes and context of that war, since there is an awful lot of material already out there on the subject. Um, but let's suffice it to say that the Korean War was, of course, the legacy of the Second World War and of Japan's occupation of Korea since the beginning of the 20th century. At the conclusion of the war, Korea was divided along the line of the 38th parallel. The Soviets were given control of the North and the Americans control of the South. Now, the Soviets installed a Stalinist communist government, which almost immediately started an insurgency in South Korea to export the uh, communist revolution there. The open shooting war conflict basically started because the United States completely underestimated the North and their Soviet sponsors' commitment to exporting that communist revolution, and the Soviets completely underestimated the U.S. commitment to preventing that from happening. Oh, there's so much more to it than that, by the way, but let's leave it there for now and say that the Korean War started on the 25th of June, 1950, when the forces of the Korean People's Army of North Korea invaded South Korea. The conflict has not actually ever been formally concluded, although the shooting did stop in 1953. The three years of active conflict saw one year spent in a war of maneuver up and down the Korean peninsula, literally, from bottom to top. This was followed by two years of reasonably costly stalemate and uh, negotiations. In the process, North Korea was effectively leveled. By U.S. air power, it is frequently said that quite literally no structure higher than two stories was left standing in the entire country, all of which had no decisive impact whatsoever on North Korea's material or moral ability to continue to wage war. On the other hand, U.S. air power proved that when operating in close support to troops in contact with the enemy, it was still a decisive weapon, to the extent that the enemy would literally not engage in operations that it would expose them to the full weight of that close air support. I'd say it's entirely fair to say that the effectiveness of U.S. air power varied inversely, and almost exponentially so, with the distance from its own troops. It was a lesson that could and should have been learned, but was not, as the next Asian conflict involving U.S. air power was to show, but that's a topic for another episode or, you know, series of episodes. Now, before we get into talking about how air power was actually used in Korea, when it worked, when it didn't, and maybe why, let's take a quick look at how the actual fighting progressed, because it's really hard to follow the action if you don't have a program for this stuff. Seriously, folks, I had not realized until I started writing this just how rapid and total the shifts of momentum were during the first year of this war. So let's break it into phases. In phase one, 
uh, which I'll call the retreat to Pusan, um, the North Korean forces invaded and pretty much utterly overwhelmed the South Korean opposition and the limited number of U.S. troops that were on the ground. The front rapidly collapsed, and only the timely reinforcement by U.S. ground and air forces allowed a stable front to be formed along the Pusan perimeter, which was the only part of Korea still occupied by South Korean and U.N. forces by then. And yes, it's one interesting sideline that is worth no, not, not worth going into here, but is interesting, is that the Korean conflict was actually approved and sponsored by the U.N., and although the United States provided the bulk of the forces, other countries, including the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, and even countries like Turkey and Greece, would provide both ground forces and air forces to the fight. At any rate, by the end of August 1950, UN forces had been forced into the Pusan perimeter redoubt at the very southeastern corner of the peninsula. Phase two began with the landings at Incheon by the United States Marines just south of Seoul on the 15th of September. The invasion, often described as Douglas MacArthur's greatest achievement, was a complete surprise to the North Koreans because they believed it was impossible to perform amphibious landings at Incheon for a variety of reasons, including extremely high tides. They were justified in this belief. Uh, since MacArthur's own planners had told him the same thing, that it was impossible, when he first proposed the landing. Uh, but with MacArthur's um, uh, urging, the planners had proven once again that the United States, and particularly the United States Marines, truly were the masters of amphibious warfare. The invasion at Incheon was very successful in that it put a large number of UN troops immediately in the rear of the North Korean troops that were attacking the Pusan perimeter, which immediately threw those same North Korean forces into disarray, and they began retreating north. The UN troops pursued them north and were back at the 38th parallel, the ostensible border between North and South Korea, by early October. At that point, the U.S. political leadership pushed hard, it must be said, by MacArthur, made the fateful decision to continue north with the intent of uniting all of Korea. By November, U.N. forces were approaching the Yalu Valley and the border of the People's Republic of China, which is what started Phase 3. Because Phase 3 began when the Chinese People's Volunteer Army entered the war. Uh, about... 300,000 Chinese troops infiltrated across the border beginning in late October, and in November they struck. Once again, the United Nations and South Korean forces were, in places, completely overwhelmed, encircled, and overrun. It, was, it has actually been described, uh, and was at the time, as the greatest military defeat of U.S. forces since the Second Battle of Bull Run. Now, while the Marines in the east of the country managed a costly and epic but controlled retreat from the Chosin Reservoir, pretty much the rest of the UN force just turned tail and ran, not even really trying to stop until they reached the 38th parallel again. But even then, they were pushed farther south, such that Seoul once again fell to North Korean forces, and this is when Phase 4 started, because, uh, finally, resistance stiffened south of Seoul, and in the spring of 1951, U.S. reinforcements first stabilized the line and then counterattacked the overextended Chinese forces. Uh, the net result of a series of offensive and counteroffensives was that by the July of 1951, after a year of fighting up and down the peninsula, the front line was more or less back where it started and where it continues to be today. Both sides dug in, and peace overtures were exchanged, and then negotiations actually began. Uh, those negotiations would continue over the next two years, while both sides tried various strategies to improve their positions, including limited offenses at the front and a continuous effort by the United States to bomb the North into submission. In 1953, a ceasefire agreement was finally signed, establishing the border and the demilitarized zone that persists until today, since no formal peace treaty has ever been signed. Okay, so that covers how the war basically played out. Let's talk about U.S. air power during the war. Specifically, as we talked about last time, we need to talk about the three United States Air Forces, 
uh, by which I mean the United States Air Force, which of course had been formed out of the United States Army Air Force after the Second World War. Then we also had the U U.S. Navy's Air Force. And finally, we had the U.S. Navy's Army's Air Force, also known as the Marine Corps. Now, we talked a little bit about the differences between the three Air Forces last time, but this time I really want to talk to you specifically about the difference in their doctrines. Okay, don't leave. Really, seriously, this is not going to be that bad, I promise. I know when I say the word doctrine, you probably think of stacks of moldering uh, documentation in some desk somewhere in a military headquarters, but that's actually not what we're going to talk about. Doctrine is not really the documentation. When I say doctrine, what I really mean is that every armed service and every air force had a basic philosophy. It was the, basically the fundamental principles upon which it's expected to fight and win the next war, and that's what it organized itself around. And the important thing about doctrine is that doctrine determines um, what you fly because you cho choose the planes that will allow you to carry out your doctrine. And it also affects who flies those planes because you train the pilots to fly those planes to accomplish the missions that you set out in your doctrine. And, of course, the combination of the planes you have and the training your pilots have um, effectively determines what tactics are available to you and ultimately what weapons you acquire to execute those tactics. So the basic point is that when you have the wrong doctrine uh, for a situation that you're confronted with, it's not a simple thing to just fix it, as the United States Air Forces found out. Now, only one of those Air Forces arrived with a doctrine that was in any way fully developed to support troops on the ground, which, as I've said, was really the place where they were going to be the most needed and the most effective. Now, we've already talked about this in general in the previous episode, but let's dig a bit deeper into the state of the doctrine of the U.S. Air Force, Navy, and Marines and talk a bit about how the doctrine affected how they arrived in Korea ready or not to do their part. Um, let's start with the U.S. Air Force. Now, we have spent a fair bit of time uh, on the development of U.S. Air Force doctrine already, so I won't spend a lot of time here. Suffice it to say that the centerpiece of United States Air Force doctrine was that the next conflict would be won with nuclear weapons, that the U.S. Air Force's job was to deliver those weapons successfully to targets anywhere in the world and to prevent the enemy from doing the same. Although admittedly, even the second part of that doctrine was only weakly developed in 1950 because the Soviets had only developed their own atomic weapons in 1949, and they really hadn't developed the aircraft capable of delivering them at the time of Korea. Now, we've talked about the fact uh, that this meant uh, that the focus of the United States Air Force budgets was to develop the B-35 Peacemaker long-range strategic bomber. We've also talked about how the organizational focus uh, of the U.S. Air Force was the Strategic Air Command because it was going to be the one that deployed those assets. And we've talked about the obvious um, effects of this doctrinal disaster uh, on the types of aircraft that the United States Air Force operated because, in fact, they had very few aircraft that were actually capable of performing tactical ground attack at all. Most of their fighter squadrons were transitioning over to the P-80, which was the first operational jet, which was a decent first-generation jet, but which was really not suited to ground attack at all. And the result was that the Air Force actually had to reactivate a bunch of P-51s, now renamed F-51, and re-equip the P-80 squadrons with their F-51s. But we haven't even talked about the limitation of even that move, because the F-51 was really not a very good choice for ground attack. Its inline, liquid-cooled engine with its large radiator mounted in the bottom of the fuselage made it extremely vulnerable to ground fire. Plus, it lacked any kind of armor protection for fire arriving from below. I mean, don't take my word for it. Studies after World War II had shown that more Mustangs had been lost in ground attack than in air-to-air -air combat. And when its record was compared to that of the P-47, which, while not designed for ground attack, was much better suited to it, um, that compared to the Jug, the Mustang was three times as likely to be lost to ground fire. In fact, pilots in Korea almost immediately began complaining about this very fact. 
especially the World War II vets who'd flown the P-51 in Europe. They agitated for the Air Force to find some P-47s, for heaven's sake, and bring them back. Well, the Air Force tried. But here's where doctrine ultimately got in the way again. There were still a few P-47s, not called F-47s, around, mostly in Air National Guard units, but there was an acute shortage of spare parts even to support the limited readiness needed to support the Air National Guard, and there was nowhere near enough to support an aircraft in combat. Also, there were practically no trained pilots, because the P-80 squadrons had all switched over from the F-51 in the last few years. They included a corps of veterans that could fly the F-51 and teach the new pilots, but there wasn't anyone short of about 20 Air National Guard guys in Hawaii within 5,000 miles of Korea that was current on the P-47. And even though a lot of those United States Air Force pilots uh, were high-time veterans, you don't just go introducing a pilot to a plane they've never flown before, give them a check ride, and send them out into combat. At least not if you want them to come back. So the option of getting F-47s for Korea really never amounted to much, and the F-51 was the plane that they would use for almost two years. So we know that the Air Force had the wrong planes for the conflict. Well, the problems of bad doctrine went deeper than that, though. They also had almost no pilots that had ever done the job they were going to have to do. Which is a problem, not just because they needed to develop the skill at actually deploying the ordnance, which would come with practice, and which <laughs> they were about to get, but more subtly, it also meant that they really had no experience judging how the ordnance worked, and how to use it, and, and how to actually deliver it for effect which is something, um, a sense of which is something that takes a lot longer to develop because it is a matter of experience and sense, not just facts and figures and numbers. And it also meant that the Air Force command structure hadn't the vaguest clue about what weapons worked against which targets. They really didn't know what a 500-pound bomb would do against an oil facility or a roadway or a railway tunnel, much less against troops dug in or in the open or against armor or other vehicles. They also had no experience, and really no procedures at all, for coordinating their attacks with the ground commanders. Worse, a lot of Air Force commanders, having marinated in the Air Force is the Winning Force doctrine since they had become a separate service, were bound and determined that they actually knew more about how to perform any task from the air than the ground com commanders that they were supporting did. Some of these deficiencies would be corrected, and corrected pretty quickly, as the frontline pilots and the squadron and wing commanders saw what needed to be done and then found ways to do it. But I think it's fair to say that the farther from the front Air Force personnel were stationed, the less they learned and adapted, and the more the pre-war doctrine interfered with their ability to really deliver the results on the ground for the troops. Okay, so that's the Air Force. Let's, let's skip ahead to the Marines, because they kind of represent the other end of the scale in terms of ground attack doctrine, and because their doctrine did influence the Navy to a large extent, particularly in the selection of the aircraft that they flew. Because, of course, unlike the Air Force, which used to belong to the Army, the Marines were still the Navy's Army, so the Navy bought all their planes for their Air Force. See? At any rate, the Marines, doctrinally, were at the absolute other end of the scale from the Air Force. As far as marine aviation was concerned, there was only one reason for being in the air, and that was to support the troops on the ground. Then, as now, every marine aviator has started out his life in the Corps as an infantryman. Yes, marine aviators still trained in and flew lots of other missions like air superiority and bomber escort, but these missions doctrinally were only practice in order to facilitate getting aircraft with ordnance aboard over the targets that they needed to strike. So, given that the Marines and the Navy had a completely different picture of what their mission was, it certainly affected the Navy's decision about what aircraft to procure and own and operate. Uh, we talked a little bit in the last episode about the fact that the primary focus of every carrier air wing were the strike squadrons, and only 40% of a carrier air wing at this time was made up of jet fighters, the other 60% were prop-driven attack planes. And unlike the Air Force, the Navy and the Marines had taken what was available at the end of World War II and had actually improved it. 
The fast attack role on the, in the carrier air wings was filled by the Corsair. That uh, started out being a much more robust design for ground attack than the F-51 had ever been, since uh, it was built around an air-cooled radial engine that had demonstrated its ability to take a hit and continue to operate, uh, at least long enough to get the pilot to safety. And unlike the F-51, the Corsair had been modified since the Second World War to add heavier gun armament and significantly more armor on the bottom of the aircraft, protecting the engine and the pilot from small arms ground fire. In addition to the Corsair, of course, the Navy also had the AD-1 Skyrider, which, as we discussed last week, uh, was designed by Douglas's in-house genius Ed Heinemann, who had distilled his experience designing the Dauntless dive bomber with the Navy's experience with the Helldiver and the Avenger to create the ultimate expression of the art of propeller-driven precision pain delivery. The AD-1 was really the first aircraft designed with the benefit of real-world experience in delivering tactical effects on the ground from the air from a single-engine aircraft, and it showed. It was just plain better than anything else available at the time. It could carry more to the battlefield than anything else, by a factor of at least two. It could loiter longer above the battlefield waiting for targets than anything else, by almost a factor of two. And it provided much more protection than anything else in the air, while not impairing the pilot's view of the target, because it had been specifically designed from the ground up with that in mind. There's really no question that every Sky Raider in a strike package was probably worth two or even four Mustangs. And of course, the Marines not only had better aircraft than the Air Force, they also had pilots who were actually trained to do the job they were about to be asked to do, because of course, Marine pilots trained continuously in the ground attack role, and they trained continuously with infantry on the ground learning not only how to drop the ordnance accurately, but also in a way that minimized the danger to friendly troops. They, and their controllers on the ground, knew how to use their abilities to maximum effect while minimizing the danger to friendly troops on the ground. Marine ground controllers and pilots proudly claimed that they had no problem calling in strikes as close as 50 meters to their own positions, even in the first months of the war. Now, while the Air Force would eventually get there, or at least some Air Force units would, they would need to learn, including a lot from the Marines, in order to reach that level of competence. But of course, it was not only the ability of the pilots to work directly with supported troops that set the Marines apart. It was their whole air wing organization, which was dedicated to supporting Marines on the ground. Marine air commanders placed themselves at the disposal of their supported ground commanders throughout the war in ways that the Air Force just never did. As a result, while Air Force pilots developed a high level of proficiency in ground attack roles, the Air Force just never enjoyed the same reputation as the Marine aviators did for responsiveness and overall effectiveness in support of the troops. In fact, throughout the war, some Army division commanders were quite vocal, once they'd enjoyed the benefit of Marine aviation support, that they preferred being supported by the Marines to being supported by their colleagues in the 5th Air Force. Um, the Air Force was actually still squealing about this 30 years later. I actually found a graduate school paper from the Air Force Academy in the 1980s that was still sniffing about this snub now, the U.S. Navy doctrinally fell in between the Air Force and the Marines, and, you know, probably a lot closer to the Marines. In response to the Air Force claims that uh, the Air Force was the war-winning arm, and that the Army was just a police force that the Navy would transport to the enemy capital once the Air Force had convinced them to give up, uh, the Navy had, of course, been developing doctrine about how to use naval, and specifically naval air power, as a decisive weapon on its own. Because the big change since the Second World War was that there was really no enemy that could be identified that was likely to have a navy that could threaten the United States. And of course, in the Second World War, U.S. naval aviation's job was to take out enemy ships. Um, well, that really wasn't a job that they needed to, to take on any longer. So instead, the navy developed a doctrine of using naval air power as a decisive weapon by being able to show up anywhere and deliver decisive impacts from the air. 
In effect, they wanted any enemy, at least any enemy with a coastline, to feel that nowhere was safe from U.S. Navy air power. Now, this was effectively what had happened in the Pacific at the end of World War II, when U.S. carriers had traveled around the Japanese-occupied coastline of Asia from Singapore to the home islands, dispensing death and destruction on Japanese soldiers and installations at the time and place of their own choosing. It is a doctrine, by the way, that in contrast to the Air Force doctrine of the 1950s, has pretty much stood the test of time. I mean, a lot has changed in 70 years since Korea, but the role of U.S. carrier air power as a primary means of force projection has not. So, as we've already noted, the mix of airplanes that would serve the Marines so well in close air support also served the Navy's force projection needs as well. The F-9Fs had the ability to protect the fleet from attack and escort strike aircraft. And the Corsairs and Sky Raiders had the range and payload capacity to attack not only tactical targets on the front lines, but also industrial and infrastructure targets far behind those lines. This was particularly true in Korea, of course, since pretty much the entire country was within range of carrier air wing off one coast or another. As far as organization and integration with ground forces, it's fair to say that the Navy was not as experienced as the Marines were, um, but because of the influence of the Marines, they were not as hostile to the idea as the Air Force was. Uh, during the times that the Navy was called upon to support troops directly during the Korean War, they provided responsive and effective support, though probably not as fully integrated as the way the Marines operated. But it also has to be said that although the Navy served in this capacity when called upon, uh, they certainly didn't see it as their primary function, and they didn't exactly go out of their way to find reasons to provide close air support directly to ground troops. Okay, well that covers where the Air Forces were coming from in terms of the missions they thought they were going to carry out, but one of the things that isn't at all obvious is how those missions were essentially divvied up and handed out, and that was also something that was, had, that was really changing since the Second World War. I mean, in World War II, particularly before Normandy, there were very clear dividing lines. Strategic targets, meaning enemy industrial and population centers, were the target of strategic bombers, meaning four-engine aircraft that drop bombs from level flight at altitudes of 15,000 feet, usually 20,000 feet, or greater. Targets of enemy infrastructure, particularly transportation infrastructure such as rail yards and bridges, were the target of the tactical air forces, but they used two-engine medium bombers, usually, again, using level bombing, but from slightly lower altitudes, maybe 5,000 to 10,000 feet. Uh, the one exception to this rule was probably airfields, which had often been the targets for fighter bombers and not just for level bombers. True tactical targets, including what we would now call battlefield interdiction, uh, was generally assigned eventually to single-engine fighter bombers who dive-bombed or strafed and rocketed things like vehicles and convoys and smaller rail yards and also bridges and other transportation choke points. Finally, close air support uh, was also the province of single-engine fighter bombers, although it has to be said that prior to Normandy, true clo close air support was pretty rare. It was more or less invented by the tactical fighter commands on the ground in Normandy and also by the Marines in the, the Pacific, though by the end of the war, it was being practiced very widely. Now, these divisions were at least partially still present in 1950 in the Air Force, to the extent that they had a dedicated uh, force of strategic bombers, B-29s, which were intended for use against large industrial targets and city centers. The Air Force's primary aircraft for tactical interdiction type sorties was supposed to be the B-26, which, remember, was the renamed A-26, but it was pretty much a dead end and wasn't being kept up to date, and it certainly wasn't going to be replaced. Really, more to the point, the Air Force really didn't have a plane type assigned to the more tactical missions, except vaguely noting that it was something maybe that fighter squadrons would handle. Uh, and all of those were re-equipping with P-80s. So there seems to be the assumption that any of the more tactical targets would fall to the P-80s if they fell to anyone at all. The Navy, on the other hand, had spent a lot of time thinking the issue through uh, as part of their uh, bid for relevance in, in the face of courtesy LeMay and the SAC. 
And their point, and as we talked about, their point was to make carrier air power capable of the full spectrum of power projection, which meant being able to take on targets beyond enemy carriers air and airfields, which had been their bread and butter during the Second World War. So the Navy had been expanding that thinking as part of their own doctrinal and tactical discussions, and they expected that their carrier air wings would be used to attack enemy infrastructure as well as enemy troops, and so it would prove to be. By the end of the war, the role of the strategic bombers had been reduced and reduced and reduced until the point where the vast majority of sorties in North Korea were being performed by single-engine aircraft, and the vast majority of targets were being reserved for them. These targets included everything from traditional fighter-bomber targets like convoy traffic near the front, to road and rail infrastructure far behind the front lines, to industrial facilities like oil refineries and ammunition factories. In fact, far from reinforcing the primacy of the strategic bomber, the Korean War started a trend that would continue in Vietnam, which replaced the concept of the bomber raid with the fighter-bomber strike and there really wasn't any going back. Okay, we have figured out what the various uh, United States Air Forces were bringing to the party and what jobs they expected to do when they got there. Um, and we're kind of almost about ready to start talking about how the actual operational experience in Korea went. <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, we're kind of also out of time. So those details are probably going to have to wait for another episode because this one's pretty much long enough already. So make sure you like and subscribe to this video to uh, provide some encouragement for there being a next episode. And tune in next time to Moving Mud, where we'll actually get around to talking about what happened in the air and on the ground in the Korean War. And for now, this is going to be Sidekick, signing off.